think, what do we think about when we think about rain? The sort of afternoon drizzle, the kind of coziness of an inclement weather, the grand gray cities in the rain. How much did it rain last week? What did it rain last month? And the life-giving force of rain, this thing that we know uh, is out there that makes everything work for us, except we have trouble living with that rain. We seem to drive it off with the first chance. We can't live with it for some reason, especially in our cities. And I have noticed that almost every surface in a city is meant for keeping our feet dry. Everything's structured because we don't like mushiness. We don't like the mud. We want our water to go under the ground, not over it. And so everything that we make is about conveying the water away from our feet, away from our existence, away from our experience in the city. And uh, it, this, it all gets thrown somewhere. We're always passing the liquid buck to terrible effect in our streamways that are scoured by these storms, habitats completely blown away every time there's a, a hundred year storm, which seems to happen every five years. Whereas we also miss the blessing that rain can bring to our cities, the amazing uh, moisture that uh, allows uh, the landscape, iconic landscapes like this, rain driven, and gives us a sense of connection to that, to that wonderful, important wateriness that the rain brings. Um, before, before we were here, the world was, uh, the world was the uh, habitat for the rain. It had every, every piece to inhabit, and it could do wh what it wanted to. It could carve, it could muddy, it could bend, it could make any change it wanted. But we can't live with those changes now. We can't straighten our roads up after every, every time oh, uh, the, the rivers try and reclaim it or the streams cover the low areas. So we do have to figure out smaller ways to partner with the rain and to work with the rain so that we do give it its space. And um, taking places like this to strangely, this is the golf course in a, in a basin that was proposed, to give it another kind of home in these unexpected places. And instead of driving the rain away from all our surfaces, to give the rain a home, to make a home for the rain in any place that we're able to. Um, this is our typical situation. We're very greedy with hard surfaces. We always take more than we perhaps need. Maybe we could share our abundant space with other things, with vegetation, and allow it to creep in and to become part of, of our hardscapes. And this idea that, um, that the walking and driving and parking aspects could be shared with nature and that nature can come into these places um, and if for some reason on Black Friday you need to park here, you, except for the sycamores that are proposed here, you could actually mow everything down and park upon it. This idea that we have not apportioned enough space, Kevin was talking about this, to the rain, that we haven't given it its fair space. We've been very greedy and we really have to share. This sort of green and gray uh, proportions have to be put back into a better ratio and we have to learn how to make uh, nature appear in our urban areas. Talking about the cracks, this was an idea of that, that same inspiration of the, um, the grass and the cracks. We were given a large project on the Delaware Biohabitats Incorporated and I, and we had to figure out how to, um, how to undo some of the pavement without paying to undo all of the pavement. And so our first, uh, our first and fairly simple solution was to cut into the asphalt here and to create a rain garden. There it is, uh, newly planted with native species. Of course, the ruderal species and uh, some exotics are gonna get in there and have, but my feeling was anything that could survive this very difficult place to grow was allowed to be there as long as it was green and some weeding could happen later. This is three seasons later, the, the, the adage about perennials of sleep, leap, sleep, creep, and leap is very true. Third year, all the perennials are doing really well. The natives are taking hold. And it, the whole 
project works sort of like a, a, a grooved platter, which, ho which uh, conveys the rain into this rain garden, which allows time for the rain to soak in. One of the things we often forget is that rain not only needs space, it needs time. It needs to be given the, the, its expansive amount of time, which if you're frustrated and you're tired and you want the mud to stop, sometimes can seem too long, but rain needs a certain amount of time for it to soak in properly. And so that's part of giving a home to the rain, is giving it the time that it needs. This project was all about softening the shoulders of the Delaware, um, bringing back a little of the verdancy that um, has disappeared because of those industrial, almost entirely hardscape shoulders of, of the river. And we created these dendritic decay gardens, they were called. The idea of if you need to take the concrete down, you have to start looking for the, for the enemy of concrete, and that becomes your friend. And the enemy of concrete is freeze and thaw and roots. And so we carved uh, these holes, we sort of Swiss cheese the, the concrete so that the roots could start to, to break it up very slowly. But it's sort of as an example here that nature is slowly taking over and does have a foothold. It has a certain place. This is not a perfect home for the rain. It's more like a squatting situation in a certain way. It's going to take a long time for these perennials to break the soil down. But it gives a kind of foothold and begins to talk about nature moving in, being invited into the hardscape in very organized ways through these holes and through the cutting through this, um, through this whole garden. And also reusing the materials on site in a way that would actually help the plants. We could not truck so much of it out. It would have ruined our budget. So we created these rubble gardens which allow for um, a, a, a place for people to walk. There is a bike trail, but if you can walk through here on a kind of broken up hardscape, and these chunks of hardscape actually protect the roots and the remnant line stripes remind you of where all this material came from. This once was a parking lot. This idea that um, we get all of the world and the rain gets put into a very small uh, contained area. We get, we get the expansiveness and the rain gets the pipe. Um, needs to be changed. We need to change that paradigm and, and switch it, turn it on its head so that we get the narrow areas, we get the smaller passages, and the rain gets an expansiveness, a spaciousness that it hasn't had before in our urban and suburban areas. And so making these kind of um, places that we can hover above the rain, this idea of uh, layering that you were talking about, this, um, that plants can be there and we can be there, and yet we don't have to get our feet wet at the same time. This place for water and a place for people, and they can be right on top of each other, and really the only difference is dryness for our feet and lack of compaction for the plants. So um, I, this is a project that's actually underway right now, this idea of hovering above the rain garden so that you can feel the plants, you can enjoy the green, but you, um, you remain dry and you don't compact this very mushy environment that would be hard to live with otherwise. And that it gives you a place to celebrate, to enjoy the rain while it's also functioning as a place that's basically drinking its own rainwater. This is an environmental center in Philadelphia. And um, I'm actually working with Brittany's mom on this project, and Meliora Designs is on this. And um, it's the idea that if an environmental center isn't responsible enough to drink its own rain from the site, who will be? So we're starting with this idea that schools and environmental centers may be the first places where these, where these kind of responsibilities, where this kind of sharing with the rain begins, and then it can spread out. Here we are. It's actually going in. This is the foundation for the project. Um, at the Schuylkill uh, Center for Environmental Education. I used to have another name. The idea that the spaces that we share with the rain, the space that we can give over to it, doesn't always have to be an important space. Sometimes it's just a leftover space. Here's a private school in Philadelphia, the Springside School, with this nasty little slot of a lawn. And here it is having now a home for the rain. It hadn't been used before, now it has a purpose. 
uh, the idea of taking the kind of vocabulary of drainage with the pipes and turning them into a kind of tributary-like pattern so that it catches people's eyes as they drive past. This is a drive-by uh, rain garden. So you can see the plants, but you can also see an artful intervention that's highly visible. This idea that you can see the conveyance, you may not understand the infiltration, but you'll get to that if you spend some time in the site. So this, it creates a space that's great for students, great for insects, too, and um, allows ways to witness the passage of water um, so that you can really see it moving through the landscape. And you can have rivers, green rivers of irises. And you, reusing a lot of the stones from the water so that, from the site so that you can see it being conveyed. And creating a terrace where once it was a nasty little grass slot, um, you now have this terrace where, if it's dry, you can sit and read if you're a student, or you can watch the rain from the uh, window or outside, too. But this idea that we don't even really know where rain goes is a big problem. I've been very interested in introducing people to their watersheds, to getting a sense of connecting rain to streamway, sky water to, uh, to stream water. And here in, in State College, in, at Penn State, at the Arboretum, is a water map that was created with um, uh, MTR at Landscapes and Overland the, uh, were the architects for the Visitor Center. This is at the entire Spring Creek watershed with all the tributaries sandblasted into the terrace. Um, and rain plays a very important role in this. It uh, is collected on the roof of the Visitor Center, the only building there at this point, and it pours out through the scupper onto the map, which is engineered so it actually follows the major tributaries and um, it, you can see uh, everything's there and present, all waterways are present, and when it's wet, it flows like a watershed in miniature, recreating that watershed. But this idea that we have to understand the connection between what's coming out of the sky and what's hitting the ground and where does it go is really, really critical. I've made pieces about trying to show that connection between rainwater and, and the height of a stream. This is the Bushkill Curtain in Easton, which is showing um, the change in, uh, in the levels of the stream over time, so you can see what happens after a major storm. It gives the, a sort of diagram, a living registration of the different flows depending on when the rains were. This is uh, a typical low water. Here it is right after a storm. This is after, actually, Hurricane Irene. And then um, when the Delaware backs up, there's a kind of quiet high water that you can register to because of this L shape of the project. And there it is back at low water again. Um, another, um, another thing that happens is the fact that sometimes there is no place to give a home for the rain. And in this case, this zero lot site, a warehouse in North Philadelphia, a recent project that we did for the Soak It Up competition in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Water Department and the EPA. All, this is all about a place that there's simply too much roof and not enough ground, no place to infiltrate. What do you do in this case? We weren't actually asked to infiltrate. We were asked just to hold the water for 72 hours so that it doesn't join the system with that gate great gush after a storm. If you can sort of parse it out at different times, um, it will work. So, and it will help the whole system. These are combined sewer uh, stormwater systems. Um, so this is our mapping out uh, where the water could go, where it's coming from. And here we're creating a way for the water to hold its to, for the, the building to hold its water, basically to wear its water for 72 hours, wearing it on the surfaces through these blue pipes here that um, then feed into, you can see it moving across the roof, coming down, hanging out in those blue pipes to the, um, to the right, and slowly um, uh, infiltrating into the tree trenches, and which then is carried to a another park. We happen to be lucky on this site to get a park. But actually, this, this, um, this situation can hold the water uh, for 72 hours because it also has a series of uh, roof gardens and um, basically sort of shallow pans on this very uh, tricky roof to build on. This project was done with Roof Garden, uh, Musco Martin, and, um, and Meliora Designs to, to work this out. And uh, the idea that some of these zero, uh, the, these, these sites that are uh, completely roofed areas 
are no longer going to function as factories in the middle of Philadelphia. They're going to be gentrified and become areas where you want smaller spaces that you can enter into, perhaps have a cafe or a series of boutiques, and you make um, areas that are water collecting and water soaking in in the interior of the old factory. Um, there's a, it's back in the back there is a, is a cistern behind a green wall where one day they'll be serving beer made out of that very same water. This idea that, that we need to live with the rain more consciously and share with the rain in, in everything that we do. We have lots of structure. Rain needs more of our real estate. And we need to give it the right kind of real estate. We need to make landscapes that actually can soak in the rain, that can give the rain a home, not lawns, not silly landscapes where, where the water flows o over and across, but landscapes that make sense for um, infiltration. Um, because we, we have to also get a little bit more used to the mushiness of a proper rainy infiltrated landscape too. We have to learn how perhaps to, to deal with the muddiness and to even celebrate it. And make ways that we can keep our feet dry while we can witness the water. And give a kind of activation to our feet, entertain our feet. Our feet are so bored of pavement. Make places where we're sharing it with the rain that we can climb over it when it's dry and we can enjoy it. And uh, we can either watch it if we're not all that able, or we can, we can be in the rain and playing in kind of urban swales, because probably everyone who works with rainwater at one point was playing in a stream when they were young, and they're getting harder and harder to find. So this idea of witnessing water and bringing it into our vision and making it beautiful in some way, making it interesting, and giving a home to the rain, because we need that. And we, we need it so that we can feel more at home on the planet, too. Thank you. Your work is beautiful, Thank and you. I feel privileged to see it. Um, clearly, you're an artist that is rooted in the scientific education. I mean, you've, you've been a scientist. You are also an artist. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you work with other design professionals to carry off this work? Right, and actually a lot of my work is um, on teams. I work a lot with landscape architects. I married one, in fact, but <laughs> and engineers are almost always on the site, um, architects, uh, and, and then working with the people who are gonna maintain the site, too. That kind of teamwork, I do believe, is the next phase of art in, in, uh, in the in this present time. I think that the idea of art on the wall has become something that some people will continue to do. It's very safe and, and fun. But I think if you want to engage people, you're going to have to bring that art out into real situations and real situations. You, you can't answer all the issues that come up, so you have to work in teams because you can't... A, a team is like a series of hard drives coming together for a kind of central brain. And, I, and artists are a really great addition to those, so this is an endorsement for anyone as teams, that it's good to, uh, to add that, that other kind of thinking in. And I do notice that when I am on a team, that everyone sort of takes their professional cap off and passes it to the next person or throws it across the table. Everyone starts thinking like an artist. Everyone gets an artistic license in the end, too. And I start thinking more like an engineer. So there's a lot of back and forth shared information when you're on a team. And it doesn't have the, I'm coming in as this formal designer, this person who makes objects. That goes out the window in the teamwork. But I think t this kind of team making, this team approaching these solutions as a team is critical. Because you think about, I mean, engineers have been after this for a long time. And they haven't really come up with much of a solution. So it's like, you guys, you got to kind of pull out and, and, and share your knowledge. But you got to bring some more ideas into how we solve these problems. And so I think these, these multidisciplinary teams of all sorts of designers is a really good idea. <laughs> well, my question is a, kind of a foolish one in the end, actually, uh, and it was related to the curtain, and I think you answered it, that those were buoys. Uh, at the time, I, I thought maybe those were painted float valves, oh, toilet float I valves. Oh, I love float valves, so I'm that, I have a whole collection of those. You too. do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they, they bang up too much, and they're very expensive. Those are styrofoam buoys. They're fishing buoys from uh, Florida, and I've used them in a lot of projects because I like their buoyancy. And they're very light, so they can ship. They've even been to Japan. So, 
Yeah. Stacy, um, I want to raise a question for you to address if you want to, but it really is a question for all of us. As we think about how uh, artful rainwater design often encourages people to engage with pooled stormwater and certainly collects and uh, a distributed system concentrates urban stormwater even through its distribution. Um, I, I, I hope that we all are anticipating what we may learn about how these structures uh, also concentrate urban runwater or runoff contaminants. Um, it, it, it's a part of the discussion that came up early on when we were proposing rainwater gardens in Maplewood, Minnesota in the mid-90s. The PCA for Minnesota was saying then, well, what about in these sandy soils? What about the movement of contaminants through the soil profile? But, and we all have know that there are, are situations where you would not want to uh, have an urban stream be surfaced uh, because of the contaminant content of the water. And I'm just, I'm just wondering how you think about that. And, and really, this is a question for us all. Um, it's something that it seems relatively little discussed in the design community. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I do notice is that water and those contaminants are going somewhere. They're always going somewhere. If you have a retention basin, it's going into that retention basin and into the soil, a traditional retention basin. And someone is going to be riding their dirt bike through there and having contact with it. Uh, so th I think that we've been living with concentrated um, contaminants the whole time. It's just that we haven't been invited in as thoroughly as we are now, as what, as what artful rainwater design is, is about bringing people into the system and allowing them to uh, relate to it. It's hard to have people not touching this, this stuff, though the untouchable things like retention basins, like pipes, the pipes end up in the river and people are fishing fish out of the river, so they are, that's, they're still in contact with those contaminants. It's true we're probably concentrating them a certain bit more, I will say that I grew up playing in a very nasty um, swale that ran off a road, and so far, so good. So I also wonder that perhaps the, the balance of, or the counterbalance of being out and, and experiencing real water, playing in nature, being outside, may actually be better um, than you know, the, the, the option where you're a little bit less germy and have less contaminants but you have no idea where your water is going and you have no relationship with your outdoor world. So I, I don't know. I, there's got to be some more study on it because I'm sure if there was a, a major buildup of something, that would be a problem. But the fact is this system's always flowing. It's always going somewhere. And somebody's going to have contact with it somewhere downstream. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I can't sit. Yes? <laughs> Not like class, right? Yeah. Uh, well, just to address that question, most of your projects deal with uh, roof runoff. And roof runoff from the monitoring is exceptionally clean with respect to bacteria and things. So I'm always comfortable with your projects and interacting with that. It's As you go further down the watershed into the streams and the estuaries, things do get a little bit nasty from time to time. But I think generally roof runoff is nice and clean, um, you know, it has some nutrients and some metals, but nothing that I would ever be concerned about from a child standpoint. So I think it's beautiful art. And sh I love it. Thanks. I love your photograph that you have up because I've heard numerous designers, some of them in this room, say, we did not intend for people to engage with the project. <laughs> And there's something about wet tennis shoes and dirty fingernails that seems inevitable, and I would hope that it happens. I'm curious in terms of the resistance you get from people. Oh. How? And you obviously, you're either getting past it or perhaps you're just ignoring it. And I'm thrilled either way because here we have dirty fingernails and wet tennis shoes and your projects seem to be encouraging it. That hasn't been as much of the problem as getting this, getting these things through all this powers that be. Um, 
I've actually had more trouble with um, uh, commissions wondering why art is having a function. And less, th and th they get so hung up on that, they haven't even asked about what comes afterwards. I think if you make, if you have a basin, you're gonna, there are gonna be questions about your basin because it starts with mosquitoes and, and, and ends with contaminants. But if it appears to be green and landscape-like, and it just happens to get flooded at various times, because these, these cores in the ground are just basically like uh, planting boxes. And so it's only when they, when they hold a little more water than a typical planting box would that you get to play in them and get very wet. Um, does this, this issue come up? And usually those commissions are inside and they don't get to see that part. So as long as it looks like plants and smells like plants, it seems to pass under the whole thing. So I haven't had that open water I've had more issues with. I've, I have proposed a number of, of things that hold a little more water because one of the issues is if you're making these projects, they've got to look good when they're wet and when they're dry. And dry is sometimes hard to work with something when it, when it looks great wet, it doesn't always look so great dry. So they have to be designed very carefully and there's often a time, particularly with the water map, where, where people say, can we run the water through on a, on a sunny day because we want to see it work and we have a whole bunch of school kids here. And so we've often thought about having a cistern and how we're going to work out with that. At the uh, Schuylkill Nature Center, the Center for Environmental Education, just changed its name, um, there is a cistern and somehow because it's sort of crazy private, it, it, it hasn't had to go through uh, the, the Philadelphia Water Department hasn't gone to check it out. Any larger than that, any larger than this one cistern, we'd probably have some problems. So you do have to, you have to bend a little bit and not, you, the standing water idea is a problem, which I, I find sad because I really love algae and I like to grow algae and um, I think people love to play with it the way you go down to a pond and play with it. So it's really, I think that's an important aspect that is being um, taken away from us with all this clean water. Thank you very much. <laughs>